welcome everyone to a new interview with Room for Discussion. With Zoom, Canvas and Duolingo changing the way we learn, we can attend class from 100,000 miles away. While we have grown accustomed to the reality of education and technology combining together, are we ready for the next thing of education, artificial intelligence? Our guest today is the uh, Director of Thought Leadership English for Cambridge University Press and also the Secretary General of the Association of Language Testers. This is the man who can tell us about the nexus of technology, education and AI in the future. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Nick Saville. Hi everybody, uh, nice Hello. to be here. I'm very humble coming onto this stage where I've seen so many famous people have been here before. <laughs> you won't have heard of me before probably, <laughs> but uh, just to add that, um, I'm getting feedback, I don't know why, that uh, my particular interest is in language learning and I, my job, I think, is to help people learn languages, and how assessment of languages can contribute positively to what you guys do if you're learning particularly English, which is what I'm mainly interested in. But I'm also interested in knowing what other languages are impacted when people learn English. So how many of you speak more than three languages here? You can take a seat, by the way, yeah. if you want. It's... Uh... Okay. It's, uh, it makes it easier to, you know, have a conversation about ah, it. Sorry, I was taking over. I no, don't it's, it's fine. It's totally <laughs> fine. Um, but we also, of course, have some questions we wanted to ask you. So first to start off, I think a lot of people in the audience right now maybe do not know what artificial intelligence for education means. So can you maybe explain what educational artificial intelligence is? Yes, um, I guess everyone's heard of artificial intelligence, AI in English, and every day it's on the news these days, it seems to be very um, common. But basically, how could we put it? It's developing systems which can have the capabilities and behaviors which are similar to humans, right? So capability can do things and behaviors can interact in a similar way. So uh, a capability might be to be able to recognize your face or to recognize handwriting. Uh, a behavior might be to interact in a conversation in some way or to give you feedback on your learning uh, after you've done a task. So capabilities and behaviors which are similar to humans. So you've got the human as the comparator. What do we do? And what can a machine do either to replace a human? And that's a big mm. question. Or to supplement or help, a, help the um, human do their work better. Right. So helping humans sounds nice, but I think <laughs> supplementing or replacing is a bit of a red flag. So who in the audience thinks it's a good idea to introduce AI into your education? You can raise your hands. Okay, that's a fair amount. <clears throat> Gonna see if we can get the number higher up at the end of the interview. But that, that, impl that implies that there's a number who don't think it's a good idea. But who here doesn't not, think it's a good idea? Or not idea? sure yet. And who here just isn't sure yet? Okay, oh. so... Let's hope we have a little bit more of a clearer picture at the end. Yeah. So just to, let's try and to help us imagine what AI will look like in the future. Mm -hmm. We're just going to play a quick kind of game. Um, tell us what, which one of these things you think um, is true, depending on, let's say we're in 2050, all right? So university in 2050, our kids will be in university by then. Um, just say what you think. There's no need to explain. Is this true? We will no longer have teachers in 2050. Um, not true. I will show up to class uh, using a virtual reality headset. Um, you might not show up to class. At all. At all. But you will have a vi virtual reality headset. Okay. I will take a test and then an AI will determine what I will study. Um, you will determine what you will study, but the AI might help you decide. Okay. 
my assignments will have been written by AI. Um, that's an interesting one. I, I don't see the point in that if, if it's done without your involvement, but the AI might write it under your guidance. So you have to still be in charge of it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be assessing you. I'd only be assessing the machine. And my assignments will be graded by AI. Already, assignments can be graded by, by AI. OK. The, the following question could be only by AI or humans in Let's AI. Let's ask that one. Will we only grade it by AI? Um, it could get to that, mm -hmm. um, but you'd want to know for what purpose you were being assessed yep. and whether it was valid and reliable if you just rely on the machine. My curriculum will be personalized by AI, so my curriculum will be different from his. Um, the, the curriculum will be decided by humans, okay. but how you follow a pathway or a, a way through it will be supported by information generated by AI, which you can use, or your teacher can use to help you. Okay, so briefly, with all of this in mind, can you explain to us what Campus for My Kids in 2050 will look like? Well, 2050, that means your kids will actually be the teachers, not the students, probably. Maybe. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so one of the things I would say is the expectations of what teaching and learning will be will be set by people who are now children, mm -hmm who have experienced the digital era, the fourth industrial revolution, from the day they were born, right? Unlike yourselves, even, who are young people who have born, you know, just before it, before the arrival of the smartphone, or myself, who was, you know, um, in the baby boomer generation in the post-war, where automation meant how you make motor cars with you know, automatic processes, not computers at all. So we have different expectations. They will have different expectations. 2050 is only 30 years away. This building is, looks quite new. Society has invested in education, which is, we would say, bricks and mortar. Mm -hmm. So I doubt whether it will be completely... Right. So we'll still changed. go and sit down in the... Tutorial. So you may have encounters between humans, which take place in spaces like this, but learning will be in a much more hybrid model where it's taking place anytime, any place, mm -hmm. uh, according to the needs or the interests of students supported by AIs. That sounds also a little bit of a lonely experience. If you yourself, I imagine right now that my class is just me sitting in my own room, like, and doing something on a computer, maybe. Do you think the social aspect of education is going to disappear? No. I mean, that's what I mean. The, yeah. the spaces we have, like this, will still be necessary for the encounters between humans, which are necessary for social life, I think. Um, but the watershed moment of COVID and lockdown mm -hmm. has r introduced the idea of people, you know, in bed doing their lessons, uh, which I, did you say you did that? I did that. Yes, yeah, I, think, I started um, university Many people corona. even were, you know, in the in the office in bed, mm -hmm. um, and it was a bit of a lonely experience for many people. So, in my workplace now, we have a hybrid model of working where right. people go in one or two days a week, but they have the flexibility to work at home or come in at different hours to miss the, tra miss, miss the um, tr uh, traffic. So we've become much more flexible. And that, f that high flex model of education, which is a name they use in the States, by the way, accommodates people who have different needs, right? So if you've got children at home and you can't go to the classroom because one of them's got a cold, you can still take, pl place, take part in the class by signing into the class, even though other people might be there physically. So you're getting this flexibility between online at, uh, or in class. So you have students in class, maybe, 
but what about teachers? Are professors still going to be involved in the university? For sure. I mean, yeah. the generation of knowledge is not going to be done by machines. It's going to be done by humans. And the, and the imparting of knowledge or the development of skills will be done with humans, I hope, in charge of machines helping. So machines can do a lot to help, mm -hmm. but I think philosophically they shouldn't be empowered to take over. And this is perhaps the science fiction world of HAL and, you know, the machines have taken over. The I'm Daleks have arrived, you know. <laughs> I mean, I think the majority of people want to still have teachers, but in reality, it is easier if you have a machine who can determine what grades will be given out, what assignments have to be written, than to have those teachers. It's probably going to be cheaper. It's going to be more, you know, uh, quick to do. Don't you think that even though we might be against it morally, at some point we will all say, you know, let's have those robots? I think we, we have to be in a position to say, let's have those robots but we need an ethical framework mm -hmm. and a legal framework which prevents them taking over, right? So um, we, in my work, in one of our research tools, is a program called Write and Improve, right? Write and Improve, guess what that helps you do? It helps you learn to write English and improve your English writing as a learner of English. And it's based on an AI which is a machine learning tool which has learnt what humans do when they correct uh, pieces of writing at different levels of proficiency. Mm -hmm. So if you submit a piece of writing to this AI, 150, 200 words, at an intermediate level, you can count to 10 one, two, three, and it will come back with feedback. Right. It will tell you what level you're at, what the errors are. And then it says, if you want to improve, here's some things you might like to do. Right. So you do it again, and then you submit it again. The interesting thing is that this can also be used in conjunction with a teacher. So it could be the teacher who is deciding what tasks mm -hmm. and then looking at the progress. Or it could be that she's looking to teach a particular thing and is looking for particular errors that are cropping up in the work of the students. Now, why is this a good thing? Well, have any, any teachers in the room here? Uh, yes, um, if, if you've been a language teacher like I have, um, my first class I taught in Italy um, 40 years ago, I walked in, there's 120 people in the room, and it was an English class. Now... I'm not going to give those kids an essay to write every week and then mark it, am I? I mean, I would spend all my time marking essays. Even if you go into a high school, you'd probably find 35 or 40 kids. So how often do they get to do writing tasks? Well, they might do them, but the teacher's only going to look at them once in a while. Mm -hmm. With the AI... You can continuously you can, look at it. You can do the heavy lifting yeah. of initial correcting or initial feedback instantly, boom, boom, anytime, any place, you know, you can be getting your feedback. But the teacher will need to then see it or interact with it if you want to build it into an educational process like a school or a university. So what we're getting here is not just um, hybrid spaces mm -hmm. like in the class or at home, but hybrid combinations of machines and humans together to do the teaching. Do you think there's a point that we are gonna reach where AI in education has gone too far? Like, do you have a set benchmark for that yourself? Um, this is where we should stop. Um, do you know the expression, we shouldn't let the tail wag the dog? This no. Is yes. an, this is an English expression, meaning the least important mm -hmm. part of the animal becomes more important than the whole animal, right? So. The technology, the technological side of education shouldn't wag the educational dog. Right? So using technology should be to deliver the benefits and values of education that we believe in. If your children believe in different values and different social norms, then obviously it would be different than now. Yeah. But 
the worst thing is if you let what you might call cool technology take over and deliver outdated educational solutions. So you're not too worried about it you know, going too far, taking over? Well, I hope, hopefully, sensible people like yourselves and, and with, with uh, communities of practice who are aware of the dangers, mm -hmm. we will address the dangers to prevent it going too, too far. But how can we make sure that like, the teachers are still in the loop to prevent these dangers? Well, um, we need a, a social contract, if you like, about AI. Okay. So it's not just about education. We need to prepare people for it mm -hmm. by raising an, uh, awareness and understanding. So people have these science fiction views, yeah. uh, whether it's you know, like robots walking around as teachers or um, HAL, the computer, that sort of closes down all the humans and takes over the world. The, this is not the vision that we have in uh, computer science and mm -hmm. in education. It's up to us to write the algorithms, to set the rules, and then develop the ethical frameworks right. and, and practical tools. I mean, parents need to know about AI. How do they find out about it? We need ways to communicate with them. Children need to know about it. And above all, I would say, at this moment, teachers need to know that they should embrace it and not be afraid they're going to lose their jobs automatically because of it. Teachers, like I've had teachers who still, after two years of COVID, can't open properly up their Zoom, who do not know how to, you know, share their screens. And this, I think, has been technology that has been there for a very long time, that has been used over the last years already in education. If they can't understand those things, or if they struggle with implementing them in a classroom, with the speed in which we are progressing education, uh, artificial intelligence. How can we make sure that they understand what we're, they're doing? I think you've put your finger on the big problem here, which is the problem of change management, right? And integration of new technology mm -hmm. into old ways. Whatever it's been in the past with technology, it's often failed to deliver the benefits because of the integration into old habits. Right? Over the years that I've been a teacher, things have come along and then disappeared again. Uh, when I was uh, learning languages, we had language laboratories. I hated them. It was like sitting there talking to the wall. So what was a language laboratory? Well, you would go into a little room with a tape recorder and you would practice speaking, mm -hmm. and it was quite good for practicing how to say the R sound at the beginning of Rivka's name, you know, <laughs> you could practice things like phonetics, but interactive communication, mm -hmm. very difficult, and has anybody got a computer laboratory in their university now? No. It was supplanted by computer laboratories, where you had to go into the room and have a computer, but that's made superfluous by these things, right? I've got it somewhere, or did I leave it in the other room? I think I have one for you if you need it. One of these things, which um, you could, any time, any place, you can put your headphones on and you can practice your listening, you can practice your pronunciation, you can do all kinds of games to learn language. So all of those things have come and gone, and they never were fully integrated, right? So they, they were lots of... Oh, white... Interactive whiteboards yeah. are another one. Mm -hmm. Huge amounts of investment were gone into developing countries, only to be pushed to one side because the teachers didn't know how to use them, or the mobile technology has taken over completely. So how can you be sure that AI doesn't become one of these technologies? Well, AI isn't a, t isn't a, a device. Mm -hmm. It's an enabler which replicates capabilities and behaviors. So it's the which interface you have yeah. is important. Hence the reason, I believe, why we have to become comfortable with, with learners having mobile devices, and I found it, it is here, always on, always in the pocket, is available for educational purposes in schools or in classrooms. Right? This, is a, this is a social challenge because policy makers, head teachers, parents, and include some people even sitting next to me, are not convinced that we should have mobile phones in classrooms. 
I mean, this is assuming that digital technologies in the classroom is always a good thing, right? But there was, a, I think, a report in Sweden um, from 2010 or from the 2010s that found that um, while introducing digital technologies was helpful for the top performers, for the bottom performers, they started to perform even worse. So, what, is what, there year, what year did you say that was? It was in the 2010s. So it's not about AI specifically, but it is about I mean, technology maybe not tech. always being good. One of the things that we've seen yeah. in the last decade, and particularly the last three or four years, is the pace of change, not only about the type of technology and the, uh, the capabilities and behaviors you can build in, but also the acceptability of some of these things that COVID shifted. Uh, and the, so COVID was a watershed moment. Do you agree that by necessity, people had to use Zoom, mm -hmm. which meant that they had to have computers or devices. And even if they weren't good at it, they still had to make an effort, which they were resisting before. You know, I'm not going to use that stuff. I'm in my mid-career. I'm too much like hard work. I'll just carry on with the old stuff. We've all shifted in the last decade to a new world, a new normal people talk about. But it's not necessarily a good normal. In fact, I'm sure that most people in this audience would say that they didn't particularly enjoy the COVID years or learn that much, not nearly as much as they've learned on campus with a physical teacher teaching the tutorials and then writing it down. Absolutely right. Um, many yeah. people had a horrid time either because they were isolated, they were, there's a digital divide, the inequalities of digital and uh, internet poverty. What it's done, though, this is, the, this is a different point, the new normal is that it has normalized things such as the use of Zoom. Mm -hmm. You know, grandparents having parties with their kids from different sides of the world, you know, you know get, let's have a dinner party over Zoom. You wouldn't have done that very... You know, it's only just... A, this is normalization of this stuff, which opens up the possibility of, of innovation so what we need to go back to is not the, the emergency, mm -hmm. which was horrible for all kinds of reasons, but the opportunity it presents to do things better. But in the end, we don't know what AI will have as an effect on the education. It might turn out in five years that was great, but it might also turn out that children actually did learn less. And aren't we right now, by not investigating that first, before you know, implementing it in education, just using our children as a field study of seeing maybe it will work, but maybe it won't. Yeah, I guess um, <laughs> guinea pigs is not the right word. Um, but we need to think about this deeply yeah. so that we don't lose the potential benefits because we're worried about the risks, right? right. So the balancing of the risks and benefits requires a a wider conversation. It's a societal conversation. This is why I say it's almost like a new social contract about how we're going to approach this. And the, the doubts and fears need to be addressed. We need to do educational research, mm -hmm. and we need to do deep um, research into how these machines work yeah. and, and validate them so you can't just launch them onto the world. So I, a couple of years ago, I worked. Well, I took part in a, a really in, um, interesting initiative, mm -hmm. which was set up in um, England, which is called the Institute for Ethical AI in Education, yeah. and it, and it was driven by uh, some some thought leaders um, linked into also to government, but also into various parts of society, which over two years had a load of interactions with different stakeholders to set up, out what you might call guidelines for ethical AI. So this raises questions that people need to ask to be reassured about before they use their children as guinea pigs or before what they... What are some of these guidelines? Um, well, it's, it's um, making sure that there are things like the, that whoever's produced the AI has done so with the interests of children in mind, right? Not appropriating an AI which does something and then selling it to an educationalist who buys it because they think it's going to make life mm -hmm. easier, but actually has all kinds of negative impacts. And then you, it's, um, I'll share the link with you, but it's got a, a sort of checklist of things right. that you can address 
It doesn't give you the answers, but it sets out the questions you will need to um, raise, and from the different perspectives. So it's, it's trying to engage different stakeholders in this discussion. So it's not driven by people who sell AI, or people who are, edu who are technologists who have an eye for an opportunity in education. So you have the technological dog, uh, or tail, I mean, wagging the dog again, because it's seen as cool, fast, efficient, cheap, all the things that you get. Which, did you mention Duolingo? Yes, I did. Yeah, well, there we go. Um, if you look at Duolingo, it's got an English test, which is in my field. It's got some cool technology, right? Very cool. But if you look at the items, the tasks in the test, they're the same as people were writing in the 1960s. Right. So the field that I work in has moved way beyond that. But the problem is that what we're working on in my world is more difficult to do, right? So if you try to put some of the things we think of as educational tasks, which have benefit for learning, into the AI, at the moment the AI can't handle it efficiently, cheaply, and so forth. But despite all these guidelines and people maybe wanting, you know, to have the best possible outcomes, there is still so much that can go wrong. I remember during COVID that the UK used AI to predict the grades of students, and it turned out that of those living in worst of areas and in poor economic situations, their grades were grossly undergraded, sure. um, causing them to, for in some cases, not even be able to go to college anymore. How can we ensure that even when people want to do the best thing, these situations don't happen simply because data itself is biased? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, how can you avoid it under normal circumstances? I mean, for, edu for education assessment, there still is a divide in education between people who are underprivileged or who have less access to educational opportunities. What COVID did was exacerbate it because you had to use technology and if you didn't have it, you were on two sides of it. The, the um, commentators on this were writing this one month after the lockdown happened. That The challenge was not locking people down for COVID, but the impact of that on people's lives, such as education, because if you couldn't get out of the room to go to school, you had no access to education, and many kids l lost out. So this is why I say you need a social contract mm -hmm. about using it, which is, n which is more like a, a, um, an engineering project to start with, to ensure that there's enough broadband access in every town, village, and community, that the access to it is also um, at a price that people can uh, afford in the same way as they can afford bread. You know, it's a, it's a necessity for life if it's your education depends on it. And you've got to make these things suitably available to people at prices they can afford, right? Or they have to be given to them like you would give food to people who have no food. Do you think it can actually, like, decrease inequality in a way if you follow through with a social contract? Or do you think it is just going to keep a status quo? I think you, you know, if we had followed, mm -hmm. this is the conclusion of the Institute of Ethical um, AI and Education, if we had in place the guidelines that come out of that work before COVID, we could have avoided some of those, uh, and had been following them, I mean, mm -hmm. We could have avoided some of the inequalities that were, were, were the, um, the most negative impacts of the lockdown. So in an emergency, you do what you can and people suffer, right? But we did keep the lights on, if you like. We did keep things going. And interestingly, a lot of innovation came out of that because you know, necessity is the mother of invention or parent of invention. And we, we saw lots of people thinking more deeply beyond scoring essays into how you can do more formative types of uh, assessment using the technology that had become available to capture information about students' abilities, their performances, 
and how you could feed back using that technology much more rapidly, much more targeted than you can if you have 40 kids in front of you, you know, three times a week in the classroom. So the teachers themselves, and there was some research done at the, uh, this is particularly for language learning, at the European Centre for Modern Languages in Graz, which collected huge amounts of information from people about the difficulties, which are, you've been highlighting, but also the opportunities and some of the innovations that came out of it, because people were forced to, they, you know, they put their thinking caps on and they were coming up with some really great ideas. So what, my, what I've been saying to people is, can we now go back to what we may have been wanting to do for many years, which is to make our assessment tasks more valid, to make our feedback to learners much more targeted, because we have an opportunity which didn't exist before COVID and the, the era of Zoom, if you like, if you want to call it that. And it's a question, I don't know. Um, we do need the engagement of many people if we're going to address it. We don't have such a social contract as the one you're describing right now. Like We don't have those very clear ethical standards and guidelines yet. While there is already progress being made to introduce AI into education, should we hold that progress until we have a more clear-cut no, I mean, contract? I would say no f very uh, firmly, because I think AI and AI systems improve when they exist, right? Mm -hmm. they, are it they work by definition in this sort of iterative, ag and some people talk agile way. Things happen quickly, but you are able to address the problems and improve them. So we're in the world of data, right? So it's all driven by data, and that itself is a big social challenge because of issues of confidentiality, privacy, et cetera, et cetera. But assuming that we can collect data and we have expertise for analyzing it, we can understand what works or what doesn't work. We can reinforce what working, we can reduce what isn't working, and we can find ways to explain how we're doing it to people. One of the challenges, as you know, of AI is it uses algorithms. This is a big word for people who, don't, who are not scientists. And increasingly, even if you are a scientist, understanding what algorithms do in coming up with AI-based systems is more and more difficult. So th this communication of difficult things to the layperson requires some practical tools and some long-term, as it were, um, investment in building a social contract. It's not going to come from somebody who just says, Here's, here you are. You know, it's not that sort of philosophical moment. So you, top down and bottom up, meeting together to allow the change to be managed effectively. So you're advocating for kind of a learning by trial and error? Yes, I mean, that's the best way to learn um, things, um, is, to, is to make sure that the errors are not impactful in a negative way. How can we? We are talking about the education of children. There has been, like, the UK study, the studies in Sweden in the 2010s, there are examples of this going wrong. Don't do what they did in 2010, for example. <laughs> yeah. is a, learn from your lessons. Learn your lessons from your mistakes. That's the first thing. And I think the future is hybrid, right? Okay. And understanding the balance of keeping them human in the loop <clears throat> under the, if you like, the guidance of society, which they call keeping society in the loop, so you get a co-evolution of the societal norms and behaviors with the technology. So the technology doesn't rush ahead and then lead to these unintended or negative consequences before you're ready to let it loose on the world. But you can't build it without doing it, right? So you have to be building it under certain conditions which are controlled and evaluating it so you can push on the positive and reduce the negative. Um, so I think we've, you mentioned the word algorithm there. Um, we've all 
or many of the audience, I'm sure, and I certainly as well, have a bit of are frightened by the term algorithm. Just in, uh, you know, we hear stories on news about um, YouTube algorithms favoring conservative videos, um, Google algorithms favoring Google products. How can we be sure that these biases aren't reflected in the education of children? Well, the thing is with, um, with data, is if there is bias in the data on which a machine is trained, then the machine will simply replicate that bias. So um, we have to be, and bias is a particular risk, right? Certainly true if you're gonna use it for education, right? So you don't want it endorsing biases which may be implicit or inherent in current education systems. So I think it's, a, it's one of the challenges for us mm -hmm. is to build to, to have data which is not biased or to be aware of those biases in the data so that you can not build them into any systems so that they simply replicate a, a, a status quo which is unfair, right? And so, yeah, that is a big problem. So understanding how things work and making sure they don't have negative impacts. But are there strategies now to overcome this problem? I think so. It, it, well. <laughs> First of all, the strategy is to, is to be aware where your data comes from, to be aware what, what um, uses are made on it in, in, in terms... Because it's, in order to make it useful, you have to do something with it. You have to annotate it in some way and then use it to train a machine. So if you do this in a particular way, you will end up with one solution, or if you do it in a different way, you'll end up in a different solution. So, uh, an awareness of the fact that this is going on so that you can, in a sense, explain what, what's in the black box is the challenge for the, for the profession of um, com computer science, really. And they, and they call it explainable or... or uh, I think it's explainable AI, right? So, uh, along with data issues, like data protection, um, non-invasive collection of data without people's permission and so forth. Uh, you've got the uses of, of it and the need to explain how you've used it to come up with an algorithm which then is deployed to do a task. Because effectively, it's not intelligent in the sense like a human. It's, it fulfills a particular task. That's what an algorithm does. We have talked a lot about what we think potential worries of AI are, but is there anything you yourself are worried about? Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about the thing, exactly the thing that you, you mentioned, that somebody will seize on some, some efficiency or cost-saving perceived uh, benefit, particularly somebody who holds a budget or is a policymaker, and seize hold of an existing technology to do a job which is better done in another way, right? So you get benefits like cost savings and efficiency, but you are removing some of the, um, if you like, goals that you set yourself for delivering high quality education or delivering high quality assessment. So there's a tension here between the, the benefits such as efficiency and the potential benefits, which are better ways of doing things from an educational perspective. Guess which one might win? Well, I'm worried about the, the tail wagging, the, wagging dog. the dog, right? So how can we make sure that we don't work in that way? First of all, the policymakers need to understand the potential negative impacts of decisions they make around efficiency and cost savings, which is the same with a lot of other things, not just AI. We asked a lot of questions so far, mm. but we also want to give an opportunity to the public to ask a question if there is anyone. So if you have a question, anyone wants to ask, they can raise their hands. In the back with the white sweater. I'd be, I'd be interested to know if anybody strongly disagrees with anything I've said and why, because that would be interesting information. For me, it's, it's not that it's a critical question, but I'm curious um, because we talk about education and AI and education as though it's a very accessible thing. But in many countries today, we see a very big discrepancy in education itself. Some countries and some students don't even have proper access to just the most basic education. 
Yeah. Um, how do you think AI can contribute to either solving or perpetuating this issue? Yeah, I think the, this is a very important question. Um, in some countries, they, um, I, I've, I've been following a project in Uruguay over a number of years, probably over the last decade or so, which they call it, um, they've, na they've named it after their national plant. Uh, and it's, it's an interesting one because it's exactly what I said. It's, it's a combination of an, an educational project and an engineering project. Because what they, they've done, it's quite a small country, so it's, you know, it, it, it's quite extensive geographically, but it's only got about three million people, is they've created a policy where broadband internet is available everywhere. So everywhere in the country, even up the river, in the jungle, if you like, metaphorically, there is access to internet. And they provided children with a device so that every child had access to the internet and a device. And they, they saw this as a, as a cost for education. You know, so if, if your government edu works out how much they spend every year per child, to be educated in primary, I don't know, 1,000 euros, 2,000 euros. This was built into their educational costs, but they, they had to create the engineering part before they could deliver the educational benefits of it. So when you have every child with a device, then you can take advantage of the difficulties they might have of getting to classrooms or getting to high quality schools because you have them in your educational network and you're connected, so it creates a connectivity for education. And you can even get teachers who are not, of a, if you have, you know, like teaching English in primary school is a big deal, but you can't find primary teachers in every village of the country. But with the internet and with every child having a device, you can bring teachers from even different parts of Latin America into a Uruguayan classroom, right? So if you do it correctly, it doesn't prevent access, it creates access. Uh, but this is a huge investment. If you happen to be in India, where you have you know, 1.2 billion people, uh, in many of them dispersed, the, the, the scale of the problem is huge. That's why they have, however, been working on, in India, you can buy smart devices, you know, this is an iPhone, so how, I don't know how much it costs in the Netherlands, but you're probably talking about starting around three or 400 euros. Well, a, a smartphone in India, which has many of the facilities of this, can be bought for $25, right? Stripped down, if you've got one of those as a, as a child, you know, you can be connected into an educational process if, if, it's, if there's a local internet. So, again, you need society in the loop here to, to open up the opportunities and to address the divide. Because without the, without the data and devices, you can't take advantage of the AI, right? This is, the, this is our conundrum for many of us. Is there another question? The white shirt in the back. Oh. Thank you. So I was wondering, uh, I in general very agree with you, especially when it comes to higher education, so universities and high schools, and I see a big future for AI and uh, electronic devices there. However, I'm still very skeptical when it comes to primary education, um, because even from my experience, I tutor and kids are it's very hard to tutor kids online, um, even when the parents are standing uh, next to them, um, just because of the attention span, the possibilities to click out of it, a lot of stuff. Um, so I was wondering if you also see this discrepancy or maybe like um, more, maybe that the AI and the policymakers should maybe focus more on universities and high schools, firstly, or if you just think it's very equal and we should just introduce AI in all um, levels of education. Because for me, I really see a big difference. And for example, you talked about the um, access possibilities. I think that um, 
solving the issue of primary education or the access to primary education doesn't lie in AI or it, it is not the first step. Um, yeah, so what do you think? Well, I think you hit, have some more metaphors. You hit the nail on the head, really. And it's a question of horses for courses. That is that one size doesn't fit all. Context, in education, like in many other things in society, context needs to be taken into account. So it may work in some primary schools, but not in others. It, it depends on contextual dimensions. So let's not try and impose solutions. Let's try and build facilities, understandings, and capabilities so that when there are opportunities, whether it's in primary or in higher education, an appropriate um, way of using that opportunity can be decided by the participants, not by me or, or the policymaker, which says you have to do this every time. And really what we're trying to do is to, well, certainly where I come from, is to put the learner at the center, right? If you are thinking about language learning, people learn languages, they're not taught them, right? What teachers do is help people learn. And increasing motivation, engagement, and uh, ability to understand what learning is like is what teachers can help with. They don't necessarily have to provide content all the time because content and practice can be supported by the machine, right? And, and you can do it any time, any place. But we need to make sure that we don't lose um, focus on what learning is like and where teaching or, in this case, the technology helps. It, it, it needs to be a solution and not a requirement, if you like. One more question. He's had his hand yeah, up for a long so, time. Just so everyone can hear as well. Um, so you did touch on the issue of data as well and choosing privacy, but I'm also wondering, because AI is primarily data-driven, so there could also be issues of where is this data coming from and who is actually represented in it? Because yeah. people learn in many different ways and then that corresponds to their different futures. Do you think that, um, let's say, cherry-picking some data with this AI could result in... Um, people like perpetuating certain inequalities that already exist? And if so, how can that be resolved? Well, I think we already touched upon it. It, it is a risk that if it's done by certain people in certain ways to perpetuate but perhaps certain interests or certain ways of thinking, there are certain dangers there or that will not be recognized if people don't understand what's going on, right? Because it looks like a shiny object, something which works and is very nice, and people will grab it. So the tools that I'm talking about are primarily tools for communication about AI, to prepare people for it through raising awareness of these issues, right? So you, you need to be asking, this AI, where did the data come from? Did you get it with the permission of the people? Are they representative of the target group which is going to use the AI? Or have you cherry-picked some available people in order to create a technology which, you're, which, in a sense, you prefer because you want to sell it or because you want to make money out of it, right? So the vested interests, particularly because it costs a lot of money to do this, um, will be there you can be sure of it. So you have to be aware of what those interests are. And, and that means knowing that there's a risk. You, you obviously know there's a risk because you're asking the question. Some people, some parents might think, oh, this is really good. I'm going to give it to my kid to use and not be aware of the risk. So how can that parent be put in a position to ask the question or be working with the teachers or with the school to ask the question? Right? So this is why I mean it's more of a societal issue than a technical one. Okay. So we've talked about these risks, but if you could implement one policy to regulate AI, what would it be? It wouldn't be one policy. Because I think not everybody... <laughs> Go back to what I said to mm -hmm. the lady at the back there. 
context is queen, king, if you like, or queen. <laughs> if you don't understand the context in which you're discussing it, you don't know what your starting point is, and you don't know what your challenge is with regard to bridging the gap of understanding right. or, or potential uses. But you, you need to, I think, as I said, whatever it is, work top down. Mm -hmm. So you need to be working with policy makers. And that could be educational ministers or it could be uh, people who do technology like availability of uh, broadband. How do you make sure that this is seen as a priority? And who do you work with as your, um, if you like, your, your experimental groups? You need people who are trying it out, who are engaging with it under conditions which protect the innocent but so you you can't have a one size fits all policy there were well me in my primary school me in my you know highly resourced university me in my you know remote high school up the jungle how do we come together as one voice and understand this has policy kept up with ai so far well i think it wasn't keeping up mm -hmm. uh, and probably isn't in many places but initiatives like the one I, I mentioned actually was initiated in, in the um, lawmaking context in the UK in the House of Lords, which is the, you know, the upper house, with people concerned about it, working with the um, thought leaders in academia and in the industry. So bringing together communities of practice to debate it. So it's created more knowledge in the, at least in some parts of the uh, government, and it's created networks of people who are engaging around the same things. And in our case, my case, and uh, in the case of the Association of Language Testers in Europe, we've been debating it now in the last two years with regard to language education, not just English, but you know, learning mm -hmm. other languages. So there's this sort of mo these movements yeah. happening E unevenly spread. So then concretely, how can we actually catch up with AI then? How can policy catch up with AI? Engage, get informed, bang on the door of the rector of the university and ask him what policy you've got in this university. Work with self-starting groups like this, this group and students' unions and reach out to people who are being educated students, learners, children, and those who are in charge of them, like the parents, guardians, or teachers. So y you need to, to create this conversation. Right. And it's a global conversation. Without the conversation, you won't come up with the answers, I think. Seems like a pretty easy answer. <laughs> so it's an easy answer, but a difficult thing to do, right? Like most things. And even if you come up with the answer, the practical issues of integrating whatever you decide is important mm -hmm. will challenge you. Right. So before we want to round up this interview, I want to ask the public the same question as I did in the beginning. After this entire interview, can you please raise your hand if you think introducing AI in the educational system is a good idea? A little bit of change. A little bit of change. Anyone who's still very, very much against? Well, that fairly against. You know, I, I think we'll take that. That's uh, I think an increase since the beginning. Then one last question. If I could travel to 2050 and do my degree there on campus like this, do you think my education is going to be better? Um, what's it like now? Pretty good. Well, I hope it will be at least as good as it is now. I'm not sure for you what would make it better, because I think this will be the question. What makes it better for you? Would it be the way you learn, what you're being taught, how you're assessed, what you can do after you've been through your education in terms of life goals or education, um, ben educational benefits? Would it be worth the investment, or would you have been best off going to be a, be a plumber or some more practical job? These are, these are questions I can't really tell you, but I think it would be a real sad thing if we made it worse yes. by having a sort of technological tail wagging your educational dog. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Seville, for coming to Room for Discussion today. And I hope that you have a wonderful time in Amsterdam. Um, also, thank you so much to our audience today. Um, you can watch this video and yesterday's interview with the last Dutch ambassador to Afghanistan online on our YouTube or else on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts as a podcast. We also have upcoming interviews with the CEO of the Dutch Stock Exchange on the 11th of November at 1 p.m. and the CEO of um, the owner of Albert Hein and uh, Bold.com. That will be on the 15th of November at 1 p.m. as well. So we hope to see you all there. And again, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for the questions. Excellent.